Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. It's great to have you here. So I'm SCM, the founder of Products That Count. Uh, Products That Count was started a little over two years ago uh, as a way to help define what makes great products. After 12 years building products myself, I still didn't have the answer. So now I'm having a lot of brilliant guests who help me define what makes great product. And it's been a really fast growing community. It's been great to, um, to see all of you guys. This would not be possible without uh, Yelp, our awesome sponsor. Um, in case you wonder, they are hiring, including engineers. And if you are interested in talking to them, there's a Yelp sign in the back. And you can um, go talk to uh, Rebecca, and she'll tell you everything you need to know about working there. The folks that we work with there um, in product, in recruiting, are fantastic. They've been with Yelp for a really long time, and, and they're, they're really phenomenal. Uh, I also want to thank our, our new partners, uh, WeChat with Shirley. Hey, oops, perfect moment. <laughs> if you don't know Shirley, you really should. She's fantastic. She's one of the most assertive and brilliant people I, I know. Um, and we have a community on WeChat that you can join. You get some free tickets to our events. You get some perks. So I really encourage you to check it out. If not because you're a product person and you know, WeChat is sort of the, the future of, of messaging and, and mobile, but also so you can get all the free perks. And then another partner that we have is Pragmatic Marketing. They have great um, program and trainings for product people. I encourage you to check them out. PragmaticMarketing.com is the URL. And I think they have a program that's coming up in April. So I, I suggest that you check it out. Anyway, so that's that. Um, with that, I want to introduce our speaker. And Kim and I were introduced a few weeks ago, and I, you know, watched her um, talk on TED. I read her first round review, and I was like, wow, I would be really lucky if I could meet that person. And then we got introduced. So that's really fantastic. She's about to get a book out, right? So that's really exciting. This Friday? Oh, Pi Day. On Pi Day. Okay, on 314. So that's really exciting. Um, but anyway, so... Most of us who build product, we need to, you know, give people feedback, and that's not always something easy to do, and she has a very uh, interesting methodology on, on how to do that. So that's it. I'm done talking, and uh, Kim, welcome. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here, um, and I hope I'm going to get a lot of great product advice from all of you. What I want to do tonight is talk about a really simple idea called Radical Candor and describe to you a little bit about the book and also a product that we're building to put this philosophy into practice, to help you all put the philosophy into practice. But the first thing I want to do is just say that if you, if you can implement Radical Candor in your work, it's going to help you build the best products of your career but also, and perhaps for my money anyway, more importantly, it's going to help you build the best relationships of your career. So in order to explain what I mean by radical candor, I'm just going to tell you a quick story about a time when my boss criticized me. I had just joined Google, and I was leading the, uh, the sales and operations team for AdSense. And I had to give a presentation to Google's founders and the CEO. And when I walked into the meeting, there is Sergey Brin on an elliptical trainer in a blue spandex unitard and toe shoes, like pedaling away. And, and, and there's Eric, and it's, he's so deep in his email, I'm thinking it's going to be impossible to get this guy's attention. So like any normal person in this situation, I felt a little bit nervous. Now, luckily... The business that I was leading was on fire. And when I said how many new customers we had added, Sergey comes to a screeching halt on the Stairmaster, and Eric whips his head out of his email. And they're like, what? Do you need more engineers? What do you need to keep this going? So, you know, I feel like the meeting's gone pretty well. In fact, I feel like a genius. And I'm walking out of the meeting, and I walked past my boss, who, who was Sheryl Sandberg at the time, 
she still is Cheryl Sandberg, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm still Kim. Actually, I was Kim Malone at the time, so I've changed. And, and I'm expecting a high five. And instead, Cheryl says to me, why don't you, why don't you walk back to my office with me? And I'm thinking, oh boy. I screwed something up, and I'm sure I'm about to hear about what it was, but I have no idea. And she starts by saying the usual nice things, and not, not in a sort of feedback sandwich kind of way, but I actually learned some stuff. But of course, what I really want to know is, what did I do wrong? And eventually, she says to me, you said um a lot in there. Were you aware of it? Now I breathe a huge, huge sigh of relief, and I kind of make a brush-off gesture with my hand. And I said, yeah, I know. It's sort of a verbal tick. It's no big deal, really. And she said, I know this great speech coach, and Google will pay for it. Would you like an introduction? And I sort of make that brush-off gesture again with my hand. I'm like, no, didn't you hear about all those new customers? I don't have time for a speech coach. I'm busy. I've got important work to do. And she stops. She looks right at me, and she says, I can tell when you make that gesture with your hand that I'm going to have to be a lot more direct with you. When you say, um, every third word, it makes you sound insecure and stupid. Now she has my full attention, right? Like cardinal sin at, stupid at Google is stupidity. Now, a lot of people would have said, it was mean to tell me I sounded insecure and stupid. And in f but in fact, it was the kindest thing that she could possibly have done for me at that moment in my career. And she wouldn't have had to say it that way to a lot of the other people on her team who would have listened. <laughs> they would have picked up on the signals. But I'm a little bullheaded. And she knew, because she watched me make this gesture, that she had to push harder than probably she was even comfortable pushing in order to get through to me. And it was the kindest thing she could have done, because if she hadn't said it just that way, I wouldn't have gone to see the speech coach. And when I did, and I had to watch a video of myself giving a presentation, one of life's more painful situations, right? You never want to have to watch yourself on video. And please don't send me a video of this presentation. <laughs> I don't always have to do it. And I realized she really wasn't exaggerating. I did say um, every third word. And the thing that was striking to me about this was that I was not right out of college. I was 15, 20 years into my career at this point. And I had given millions of presentations. Well, not millions, but I'd given a lot of presentations. I had raised millions of dollars based on presentations I had given. And I thought I was pretty good at it. And so it made me wonder, why had no one told me? It was as though I'd been going through my whole career with my fly down, and nobody had the common courtesy to say, hey, zip up your fly. Like, if I knew it was down, I could zip it up. It wasn't beyond, but somebody needed to point it out to me. And, and it's, this is how many of you have already heard the um story, by the way? Like, I've told it a bunch of times. It doesn't, it, it's not always around something so trivial as sort of, uh, the way you talk. I, I started a company about a year ago, and we're building this product, the Candor Coach, which is an app that will help people put the ideas that I'm about to describe to you into practice in their everyday work. And I had given this a lot of thought. I had spent four years writing this book. I thought I knew exactly what the app should do. And after, after I'd been at it and we'd built two of them, the first one wasn't good, then we built the second one, one of my investors, Hunter Walk, said to me, you're not a product person, Kim. You have got to hire a product person. You've spent so much time thinking about the philosophy that you have forgotten how to build, what, what this product, you don't even know what this product should do. Everything that you think is one step is actually like a hundred steps. And you're, you're going to lose your, your users. But I'm, I'm here to help. I'm going to help you, you know. Get, so again, what, what was it, and that was hard to hear. Like it was, it was hard to hear from your investor that your product sucked twice, right? Um, 
But it was really helpful. And what was it that allowed Hunter to do that? What was it that allowed Carol to tell me that I sounded stupid when I said um, every third word? It was two really simple things. I knew in both cases that these people cared personally about me. They had both done a bunch of things to show that they were invested, not just in the work I could do, but in me as a human being. When I moved from New York to California to take the job at Google, Cheryl invited me to join her book club. When I had a, when a family member got sick, Cheryl said, go and make sure that, that your family's okay. Don't take it as vacation time. We've got you covered here. And she did that not just for me, but for a lot of people, everybody really who worked for her. Same thing with Hunter. I knew it wasn't just about the company. He was, he was, he, he's an old friend and he was investing in me personally. So I, I knew they both cared. But in neither case did the fact that they knew me well and that they knew what they were going to say was going to bug me. In neither case did, did they let that knowledge that I was going to be upset prevent them from challenging me directly. So I spent once 10 weeks at McKinsey in the summer. And so I like to boil everything down to a two by two, right? Two by two, all of life's problems can be analyzed by a two by two axis. And so care personally, challenge directly. I wanted to really think about what, why this was so rare, because both of these things seem pretty, pretty obvious to do. So let's, let's take each dimension one at a time. So let's start with caring personally. Now, nobody starts their career thinking, I don't give a shit about people, so I think I'm going to be a great colleague or a great boss or a great product manager or a great engineering manager. Um, no, that's not how it works. So what is it that moves us down on the care personally axis? I mean, there are people in the world who are psychopaths. But nobody, I did my research, no one in this room is a psychopath. So we're not talking about the psychopaths. What is it that moves the ordinary people like us down on the care personally axis? I think this begins around the time you're 18 years old and you're right at that moment in your life when your, your ego is very fragile, but your persona is beginning to solidify. And right at that moment, you get told, be professional. And somehow, for an awful lot of us, that means leave your emotions, leave your true identity, leave, the, leave your humanity, leave the very best part of yourself at home and come to work like some kind of automaton. And that is not a recipe for caring personally, right? This is what, this is, this is where we give a damn. You can't care about other people with some small fraction of yourself, right? You've got to be more than just professional. In fact, one of, one of Cheryl's mantras on her team at Google was to bring your whole self to work, right? So you've got to bring your whole self to work. I'm not saying be unprofessional, but you've got to be more than just professional. So why is being professional so dangerous? What is it that happens when you start out being professional? You pretty quickly move towards apathy, right, where you just don't care anymore because you're, you don't want to get too engaged. And it's natural to care about your work. We spend more time at work than we do anything else in our lives. So, so the apathy is sort of hard. And, and if, you, if you keep going, if you keep going down this axis, we all have this tendency in our minds to divide the world into friends and foes, right? And when you divide the world into friends and foes and you, and you sort of put professionals over there and friends over here, pretty, far, pretty soon you become foes, not just apathetic. And this, what happens at the very bottom of this axis is what Eric Erickson calls pseudo-speciation. And this is basically where you divide the world into friends and foes, into my group, my team, and their team. And their team, those others over there, are people you can degrade without conscience, right? 
And you see this happen all the time at work. I mean, pseudo-speciation is usually used to explain genocide. And I don't want to exaggerate the pain of office politics. It's not that bad. But, but it happens all the time. There's, somebody once said, it's amazing how the further somebody's desk is from mine, the stupider and more immoral they are, right? Like, don't let that happen at work, because all too often, we tend to treat our colleagues like en enemy combatants. We tend to treat our employees like pawns on our chessboard. And we tend to treat our bosses like sort of tyrants to be toppled. And that's not a recipe for caring personally. So at the very least, give a damn about the people who you work with. And when you're really lucky, when you're truly caring personally, you will actually love the people who you work with. Now, not in an inappropriate sense of the word. I'm not talking about ruining everybody's marriage. But you can, you, you may as well. You spend more time at work than you do in any other activity in your life. You may as well love the people who you work with. The problem is that love is not all you need. You need something else, right? That's where the challenge directly access comes in. That's where the challenge directly dimension comes in. This is what I call the willing to piss people off dimension of radical candor. Colin Powell said that leadership is often about being willing to piss people off. So what does this mean, and why are we so reluctant to do it? I think this, the problem here starts when you are 18 months old. How many of you had a parent who told you, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all, or some version of it, right? Raise, show of hands, right? Almost all of us. And now, all of a sudden, it is your job to say it, right? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. Now it's your job to say it, right? So that is, and I would argue that is, it's not just your job, but if you're in a leadership position, if you care about the people who you, who you work with and also about the products that you're building, it's not just your job, it's your moral obligation, right? Because we, it's very hard for us to see our own mistakes, easier to see other people's mistakes, and we rely on each other to point out, point out errors. So that's why radical candor is so hard. Training we've had since we were 18 years old, training we've had since we were 18 months old. One of the things I've done to try to make it easier for people to be radically candid is to name each of the quadrants sort of with some emotionally charged language. So when you challenge directly, but you fail to show that you care personally, I call it obnoxious aggression. This is commonly called the asshole quadrant, right? Now, there's a reason why I didn't call it the asshole quadrant. And the reason is that I don't want you to use this framework to judge people. Don't start writing names in boxes. It's very tempting to do that. Don't do it. It's not helpful because we all spend time in all of these quadrants. We all make these mistakes. Instead, use this framework to guide the conversations that you have, to guide your feedback, to become more aware when you're veering into one danger zone or another and to move towards radical candor. So what's the worst quadrant of all, where you neither show you care nor challenge directly? That I call manipulative insincerity. This is where political behavior happens, is where passive-aggressive behavior happens, so on and so forth. Now, the quadrant where most of us make our mistakes, where 85% of problems in the workplace occur, is what happens when you do care personally, and because you're so worried about not hurting somebody's feelings, you fail to challenge them directly. This I call ruinous empathy. So what I want to do for the next kind of six minutes or so is tell you a quick story about each quadrant to better explain what I mean by each one. So let's start with radical candor. One of the, one of the times, but, but sort of the origin story really for me for radical candor came in New York City. It was 2000, 2000, 2001, just after 9-11. I'd gotten this golden retriever puppy to help me feel better after the, after the attacks. And 
I loved this dog, and I never said a crossword to the dog. And as a result, the dog was completely and utterly out of control. And so I'm walking down the street. The dog's jumping all over the place and leaps into the street. I pull her out of the way just as a cab almost hits the dog. And I'm standing there sort of with my heart in my throat. And a, a man, a perfect stranger, looks at me and he says to me, I can see you really love that dog. That's all he has to do to move up on the care personally access. I can see you really love that dog. A mistake that a lot of people make with radical candor is they think it has to take forever. They think they have to take people out and schmooze with them and get to know their family, their kids' names and all that stuff. No, all he has to do, I can see you really love that dog. And then he looks at me and he says, but you're going to kill that dog if you don't teach it to sit. Now he's got my full attention once again. And he looks at the ground and he says, sit. The dog sat. I had no idea the dog even knew what that meant. And I kind of look at this guy in amazement. And he, and the, and he says to me, it's not mean, it's clear. And the light changes and he walks off and leaves me with words to live by, Right. So so you can change somebody's life in just the amount of time that it takes for a light to change if you take just a second to show that you care and to, and to say what you see, right? Um, so, so that's sort of the, the radical candor origin story. Now, next, obnoxious aggression. I will assert for the record that I am not an asshole, but I do sometimes behave like one. And I bet all of you just occasionally do the same thing. So here's my story about the descent into obnoxious aggression. Also, shortly after I joined Google, I got into an argument with Larry Page about an AdSense policy. And I sent an email out to a bunch of people that said, Larry claims he wants to organize all the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, but if it'll make us a buck, he's willing to create clutter sites that muddle the world's information. Not my most politically astute moment, right? So why did I do it? Why did I do it? It was a clear case of, some people might say that's radical candor. That was not. That was obnoxious aggression. And the reason why I did it I think, is that I believe, and probably a lot of you do as well, that there's a special place in hell for people who piss up and kick down. But that doesn't mean it's such a great idea to do the exact opposite, right? Caring personally is something that you owe to every single person who you work with, whether that person is the homeless guy you're walking past in the street or the creator of the economic miracle of our generation, right? Caring personally is basically common human decency that we all owe one another, regardless of what we do. So, so anyway, that was, that was my excuse, but shouldn't have done it. A friend of mine calls me up afterwards and says, why did you send that email? That was incredibly obnoxious. And I sort of realized, gosh, that was incredibly obnoxious. Why did I do that? Now, here is the hero's journey to manipulative insincerity, right? The problem is never the crime. The problem is the cover-up. In fact, I found out later Larry thought the email was funny. But what I did next was not so funny. So the next time I saw Larry, because I realized how obnoxious I had been, I, I said to him, oh, Larry, I'm really sorry about that email. I realized that you were right, and I was wrong, and I'm really sorry. Just two problems with having said that to him. The first problem was that I was lying. I didn't think that he was right and I was wrong. Uh, and the second problem was that he's got a pretty good bullshit meter, and he knew that I was lying, right? And so it was like one of those cringeworthy moments where he looks at me like I'm a pigeon that flew over and pooped on his shoulder and kind of walks off. It was so bad, the guy sitting next to me kind of patted me on the shoulder and said, he likes it better when you disagree with him, right? So, th but this, is, this happens all the time. When you realize you've been a jerk, it's very tempting to back off of your challenge, to go the wrong way on the challenge directly dimension, instead of moving up on the care personally dimension. So don't do that. Don't let that happen to you. 
In fact, a lot of people will give you advice to back off. But it's bad advice. Like, go the right way on the care personally dimension. Don't go the wrong way on the challenge directly dimension. So that's manipulative insincerity. Finally, ruinous empathy. To explain what I mean by this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about probably the worst moment of my career. So I had hired this guy, we'll call him Bob, and I really liked Bob a lot. He was charming, he was funny, he would do stuff like we were at one of those management off-sites that is interminable, taking way too much time, we're playing some stupid get-to-know-you game that's taking forever, and nobody dares sort of call nonsense on the whole thing. And finally, Bob says, I've got a better idea. Why don't we just go around the table and confess to one another what candy our parents used when potty training us. Weirdly, we all remembered, but it was okay. It was fast, at least. And for the next 10 months, every time there was a tense moment in a meeting, Bob would whip out just the right piece of candy for the right person in the right moment. So anyway, I loved this about Bob. He was weird, but it was funny. I liked him. <laughs> there was just one problem. Bob's work was terrible. He was doing a horrible job. And because I liked him so much and didn't want to hurt his feelings, I didn't tell him. I kept giving him kind of nonsense praise, like, oh, jo Bob, you're such a genius. I know you could, you know, this is a great start, but you can probably do a little better. And this went on for 10 months, and eventually the inevitable happened, and I realized that if I didn't fire Bob, I was going to lose half my team. And so I sat down and had a conversation with Bob that I should have had a long time ago. And when I was done, he sort of pushed his chair back from the table, and he looked me right in the eye. And he said to me, why didn't you tell me? And as that question is rolling around in my head with no good answer, he said, why didn't anyone tell me? I thought you all cared about me. And I realized in that moment that I have failed Bob. I have failed him in six important ways. I have failed to get praise or criticism from him. I failed to solicit feedback. Maybe I was doing something so crazy. I found out later the reason that Bob was doing such bad work was that he was smoking pot in the bathroom. Like, maybe that explained all that candy. But anyway, I didn't know it... <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, and maybe if I had asked him for some feedback, I would have learned that I was doing something that was driving him to toke up in the bathroom, right? But I didn't, right? I just gave, I, I just, I never asked him for feedback. So I got an F on that dimension. I also failed to give him praise that was meaningful, that there, there, were, there were some things he was doing that was good, but I just gave him praise that was sort of a head fake. And I never gave him... Criticism. I never told him that his work wasn't really good enough. And worst of all, I failed to create an environment where everyone would tell Bob when he was doing really good work, but also equally importantly, more importantly in this case, when he was going off the rails. And because I had failed Bob in all these different ways, I was now having to fire him. And it was too late for me to fix it for him. And all I could do in that moment was to promise myself in a very serious way that I would never make that mistake again. And that I would do everything I could to help the people who I worked with never to make that mistake again. And that's a big part of what motivated me to come up with, with this framework, right? To help you. Now, of course... A quick 20-minute talk is not going to change your behavior, especially around things that made you, that started when you were 18 months old and then got reinforced when you were 18 years old. So if we had more time, I would focus, I would tell you very specifically about some things you can do starting today that will help you put these ideas into practice around soliciting feedback, around giving feedback, around gauging it, understanding how it's landing for others, and around encouraging it. And I'm happy to hang around and tell you about a lot of those things. I also wrote a book coming out on Pi Day.
case you didn't hear that before. Coming out March 14th. You can all buy it now. It's available for pre-order. How many, there's supposedly, how many people would you say there are here? 100? 100 people? If each of you buy two copies, we're 2% of the way towards the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> I'm just saying, you can move the needle here tonight, right? Especially if you go buy a bookstore, like an independent bookstore, and ask them to order it, right? And we also, we also are building a product that is going to help people put these ideas into practice, right? Uh, and and it'll, it'll walk you through the basics of giving praise, giving criticism, soliciting criticism from the people who you work with. So I would love to spend the next 20 minutes or so at answering questions from you all. Um, and I'm, I, I'd also love it if you want to sign up to test the app, bang on it, tell me what sucks so we can make it better. Give me some radical candor on radical candor. Uh, that'd be great. So looks like we got the first question over here. Yeah, so the question is, how, how can you best solicit feedback, right? Is that a good summary? So I think, there are, I think there are four things to keep in mind for soliciting feedback. One of them is to come up with a go-to question, right? It's, it's kind of awkward to ask somebody for feedback. So think in advance about how you want to ask. There's a, there's a million different ways to do it. The question that I always used to like to use was, and you can't overuse your question, so don't ask everybody every day this question. But one that I used to like to use often was, is there anything I can do or stop doing that would make it easier to work with me? Pretty simple question, and I often learned a lot when I asked that question. So think about what question would work for you. Another thing to do is to ask specifically for feedback about something you just did. Another thing to do is to criticize yourself and let somebody react to your own self-criticism. There's a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways to do it, but think about what's going to be most comfortable for you. Now, once you ask your question, it sort of seems like you should try to set the other person at ease, right? You should try to make the other person comfortable. But in fact, it's the exact opposite. The thing that's going to make the other person comfortable is silence, is for you to let them off the hook. So for example, if I say to you, how's this presentation going? Perfect. Great. Thank you very much, right? So now I just asked you a question and learned exactly nothing. So I wouldn't, I'm not going to do this to you in public because that would be cruel and unusual punishment. But if we were talking one-on-one, -on -one, I would say, I know not everything's perfect. Like, what could be better? Oh, my God, I haven't. It's, it's not um now, it's so. That's my. I'm, I'm sort of migrating a little bit. <laughs> Once you, once you have embraced one way to embrace the discomfort, simple thing you can do starting tomorrow is ask your question and then count to six in your head. Six is a long time, right? Most people can't endure that kind of silence, and they'll tell you something. So if we were in private, I would, I would say, come on, tell me what really could have been better. And then I would just smile and sit there. <laughs> You know, until you say something. Uh, so, so, so work on just now. So now you, you have a question? Okay. So I'll come back to you. I promise. I won't forget. So now you've, now you've embraced the discomfort. You've dragged this person unwillingly out on a limb and they've said something to you. Third thing, it's really important to listen to what they say with the intent to understand it not to reply to it, not to respond, not to justify, not to get defensive. Very hard when you're asking for criticism not to get defensive, but it's crucial and obvious, but very difficult that you shouldn't get defensive. Now, unfortunately, there's a fourth step. It's not enough 
to forbear from throwing a chair or sharp object at the person who gave you the, the criticism, right? You have to reward the candor. The only way you're going to get criticism again is if people know that they're not wasting their breath when they give you criticism. That if, if somebody tells you you have BO, that you'll go out and buy a stick of deodorant, right? And use it, not just buy it, but use it. Um, now, of course, um, see, I still say it, God damn it, but not as much as I used to. It's a terrible thing about telling that story. So it's very important. So these, I'll tell you, here's the, here's the secret about the ums and the so's. It's because I'm uncomfortable with silence. That's why it was so hard for me to learn to count to six. When you, um, see, I, got, I didn't say any of the words, not now, so um, when, when you are rewarding the candor, people know that it's worth telling you something. But that doesn't mean that you always have to agree with all the feedback. This is not a thank you, sir, may I have another kind of situation. You will sometimes disagree with the feedback. When you disagree with the feedback, it's really important that you, not, that you find some nugget. No matter what somebody told you, there's 5% of it you can agree with. So focus first in the moment on the part that you can agree with. Check for understanding. Say, so what I hear you saying is that you hate blue jeans and you think I should always wear a dress. Is that right? I may disagree with that in my core. I'm never going to wear a goddamn dress, but I just want to make sure that I understand what you said. And then you wait a day, and then you go back, and you explain why you're not going to take action, why you disagree with the feedback in a way that's not defensive. Sometimes the best reward is just a fuller explanation of your own thinking. Does that make sense? Does that help? You had another question, and there's a couple more. Aggression? Mm -hmm. So the question is, in my story about the obnoxious email I sent to Larry, what would I do to make it radical candor? I would have done a bunch of things. First of all, I would, I would, I would not have been so arrogant in the way that I said it. I, it turned out that I just didn't understand, actually, his proposal. And so I would have asked questions more humbly rather than launching into this, uh, into this I'm certain I'm right. I would have tried to, to offer a suggestion that was more helpful than just this sort of scream. I would also have done it in person instead of sending it, in, instead of sending out publicly to 30 people and, and in private. And most importantly, I wouldn't have made it about Larry's personality. We should have been talking about an AdSense policy. And instead, I turned the conversation into this question about whether or not Larry was greedy, which A, he's not greedy, and B, was irrelevant to the situation. Or probably A, was irrelevant, and B, he's not greedy. So. It's really important to stay focused on the issue at hand. It's really tempting. And I tell you, we see this in our political discourse more than any other place right now. But it's really tempting when you disagree with somebody on an on a, on a issue that's complicated and hard to understand to ignore the complicated, hard to understand issue and to, to attack something simple like, is this person greedy or not greedy? And, and that's a big mistake. There's a great book called Thinking Fast or Slow by Kahneman that talks a lot about this mistake. It's so easy for us to substitute an easy question for a hard one and to let the fast-moving lizard brain take over and address the easy question instead of our slow, slower, sort of more thoughtful part of our brain. Do the, I'm going to take a question in the back, and then I'll come up here. Um, look at that. See, I saw that hand way in the back.
So the question is, as opposed to just being an individual, how can you create a culture of radical candor on, on your team? And culture, culture is obviously tricky. And especially if you're talking about a big team, there's one of you and maybe you have five or 10 direct reports, but what if there's a thousand people? Like how do you, how do you make this scale? Here is my description of sort of your, your wheel as a manager that will move you and your organization forward. You are at the very center of the wheel, and the most important thing there is to stay centered. If you get out of whack, everything gets out of whack. So you've, you've got to stay centered. And then the next concentric circle out is your relationships. I believe that at the heart of being a great manager that's going to create a great culture is a set of a small number of relationships. You can't have relationships with a 1,000 people, but you can have a relationship with each one of your direct reports in a real human relationship. If you think about Tim Cook and Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs wasn't known for his warm and fuzzies, but Tim Cook offered Steve Jobs part of his liver and Steve Jobs refused to accept the sacrifice. Like, I don't know how you explain that except with one word, and that's love, right? That is real, that is real love. And so at the, at the, ve- I have five minutes left. At the very core, like after you, there's a set of relationships with your direct reports. And based on those relationships, but also the way you form those relationships, is how you conduct your responsibilities as a manager. I would say you have sort of three core responsibilities as a manager. You have to give feedback. You have to build, you have to give, get, and encourage feedback. You have to build a great and cohesive team, and you have to achieve results that everybody is proud of. And when you keep yourself centered, you build these strong relationships, you conduct your, resp- your responsibilities in such a way that you're creating a culture of feedback, that you're, that you're building a great team, and that you're achieving great results. From that emerges culture as sort of the exoskeleton of the whole thing. And that scales. The relationships that you have with your direct reports, if they're good and strong, they, they then get replicated, right? If you have sort of dysfunctional relationships with your direct reports, it's astounding how fast that gets propagated out through an organization. Does that, does that help answer the question? Cool. All right, one question here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm here to be an asshole. Thank you for the question. It's a really important. It's a really important question, and it's one of the uh, the most common ways that what I'm saying gets. Misinterpreted. I had a reporter from the Wall Street Journal call me up and say, everything that's going on at Uber, isn't that a great example of radical candor? And I'm like, God, I hope not. Uh, so, so anyway, I hope I corrected her. And I, so, so I think that the most important thing about radical candor is to remember these two dimensions. One is challenge directly, and the other is care personally. And, and the other person has to perceive that you care personally. It's not enough to just care in your heart. The other person has to see it. Radical candor gets measured not at your mouth, but at the other person's ear. And if you challenge directly, but you don't show that you care personally, that is obnoxious aggression. And obnoxious aggression is very different than radical candor. And so I, 
one of the things I've been trying to do recently is to make sure that we show the whole two by two, not just radical candor, because the words, any words can be misinterpreted and perverted. So I think the most important thing is to focus on care personally as well as challenge directly and to focus on the fact that the other person has to understand it. I would say that radical candor is, it's sort of universally human. Like there's love and truth are not culturally relative terms, right? We all, we all have the, those notions. Um, but it does get, it does, it's, it's culturally relative and it's also interpersonally relative. The way that Cheryl had to get through to me was very different than the way she would have gotten through to Emily White, who also worked for her, who would have heard it the first time. I'm a little more stubborn, right? If, if Cheryl were managing my sister, she'd have to be gentler yet and go to greater lengths to show that she cared personally, because my, my sister, I have a very thick skin, and, and my sister is very sensitive, right? So, so it's very important to adjust the way that you're talking to people for who that person is as an individual. And when you go from culture to culture, it's important to adjust sort of more generically. I managed a team in Tel Aviv and a team in Tokyo at the same time once. And Radical Canter feels very different in Tel Aviv than it does in Tokyo. In fact, with the team in Tokyo, I called it polite persistence, not radical <laughs> candor, because politeness was the way that they showed they cared personally, and persistence was the way that they thought about challenging directly. Whereas in Tel Aviv, the politeness would have been just seen as kind of unnecessary bullshit. And, <laughs> and so, and that's almost like a sign of disrespect. And so, so you, you can adjust these things depending on who you're talking to and the culture you happen to be working in. And it's different not just from country to country, but from company to company. I would say that Google is radically candid with a twist of ruinous empathy, whereas Apple was radically candid with a twist of obnoxious aggression, right? So there's, there's a lot of differences. A okay. quick follow-up oh. question, and then we One gotta... last question, then. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, so one of the things that I found really helped at Apple was we would put the, we would print the two by two out and we would ask each other, so where do you think that landed? Where do you think that comment or that suggestion landed? And the person speaking would often think they were being radically candid and would be shocked to find out that others found it hurtful, right? Or more frequently, actually, what would happen is I thought I was being radically candid, and the other person thought they were that I was pulling my punches, right? And so I'm like, oh, it's easier. It becomes much easier for me to challenge more directly when I see this person thinks I'm pulling my punches. Or, oh, I understand it's necessary for me to show I care because everybody in the room thinks I'm being an asshole. So, so often just sort of putting, put a frame, get stickers. You can use, that's why we built the app for this exact reason. It helps. All right, awesome. I think we're at time. Kim, thank you, thank you very much. much. Thank you. We have a bunch of gifts for you. Thank you. Another great book you should all buy a lot of copies of. Thank you. Thank you. I signed it for you. All right. Um, okay, so uh, one thing that we really care about is uh, feedback. Every month uh, we measure uh, the net promoter score of every talk. And what it does is two things. One is it helps us... Um, uh, produce better events for you guys, but also it helps uh, Kim get some uh, radical candid feedback on her talk. So uh, you should have an email in your inbox right now, if you pull it up. And please fill in our survey. It takes a very short amount of time. Um, next month, our talk is um, on how you go from being a product manager to being the CEO of a billion-dollar marketplace. And the speaker we have is 
the CEO of Upwork, who started as a, a product manager at PayPal and then became a product executive at Upwork after a couple of startups and then a CEO. So he's going to talk about his personal journey. He's going to talk about what kind of challenges he faced as he grew in responsibilities and as his companies grew. Um, I think that's going to be a fantastic talk. It's on March 22nd. If you want to grab your ticket, um, I encourage you to do this. Now we have a few early birds that are left uh, for this event. Um, one last thing, we're going to do shout outs. So that's a very popular section every month. Uh, if you have stuff that you'd like to share, uh, you're looking for a job, you're hiring, you have a new product, you have a startup, you're fundraising for, I, I'm going to ask you to come here and, and gather right here and you're going to have um, 10 seconds or so to uh, to pitch your, uh, your idea, your product, uh, what you're looking for. So if you please come and gather. One. Two, count to six, <laughs> three, <laughs> please come over, four, five, okay, no shout outs, I don't think that's ever happened, okay, All right, please hurry up, okay, come on, <laughs> and you have one too, Shirley, come on over, thank you. Hi, I'm Amy LeBlanc. I actually work for a language training company. We do cultural training, language training, interpreting, and translating. So if you are ever interested in a conference with translations or you speak multiple languages and you want to offer your services, we're always hiring subcontractors and we're hoping to develop different locations all over. So feel free to talk to me after. Thanks. Here, you get a gift for speaking up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shirley, and I'm working for WeChat. So uh, here I have a secret WeChat QR code for the group for products that come San Francisco events. So um, if you have WeChat, and if you do not have WeChat, download WeChat now, and then um, come to me and scan the QR code, and I will drop you into the group. So every month we will give out free tickets for the event, and also um, for people shouting out here that we have um, some gifts from WeChat to give out to you guys too. And we really love this event, and also um, for the group, it's about everyone, you can continue to shout out, network, and make awesome friends in the group and talk online, offline. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, come on over. If, if anybody wants to do a shout out, please gather here. Number one, thank you very much to the host for putting this on. This is, um, I learned a lot today and thank you to our speaker for all the new, uh, things to take home and study. Um, I'm here, um, from Gantry, G-A-N-T-R-I, and we're currently working on a product development platform to kind of take away the hassle of, uh, bringing a physical product to market, uh, between, you know, getting a CM and like taking care of inventory and distribution and whatnot. So I really just wanted to get up here and ask, um, if anybody out there is a product designer, industrial designer who's looking to, uh, develop a particular kind of product to check us out. Um, we'd love to talk with you and see if we can get one of your ideas uh, into a marketplace and start selling your product. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Here's a copy. I can sign it for you at the end. Oh. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim. I'm a student at SF State, which is right outside of San Francisco. Um, and we have a computer science and startup club there where we host events every couple weeks. Or... Oh, okay. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> We host events every couple of weeks, and we have a bunch of guest speakers come uh, talk to students about whether it's software engineering, product management, design. Um, so if any of you work in the field and um, want to come help out students and give a talk to people who are early in the career and uh, want to learn about, as I said, UX, uh, engineering, PM, um, we'd love to have you. So just come and see me, and we'd be happy to organize that. Thanks. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Angela Flynn and I am a, a customer success leader and um, I love helping companies scale to keep their customers happy. Um, one of my goals is to be a chief success happiness officer, but I'm really interested, I started my career in product management, moved on to the customer side because we launch products and then we want our customers to adopt the feature. So, this is a topic I'm really passionate about, so if you're interested in talking about it.
Uh, hi, my name is Chris Corzine. Um, I'm working with a startup called Twist Bioscience, and we are currently hiring a lot of different roles. Uh, you do not need to have a life science degree, um, and you would get to work at a company that is making synthetic DNA and changing the world. Uh, if you want more information, please come find me. Thanks. Hey, what's up? My name is Ron. I'm a product manager at Square. We're hiring for all sorts of roles, product, design, engineering. Come find me. You don't need a life science background either at Square. Um, we make commerce easy if you guys don't know who we are. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Calendar. Uh, my name is Shannon, and I'm a founder of a new company called Epic Teams, and we're helping startups create high-performing cultures. We have six-month management accelerators where we help you design your own in-house coaching culture. Um, hi, my name is Lynn Wang, and I work at Weight Watchers, um, and we also have open positions. Uh, we're hiring for a designer and some engineers. Um, the job postings are on WeightWatchers.com website. Um, we, our product tech organization here in San Francisco is about 35 people, and uh, we've got a lot of cool things. Um, the social team is also out here, so. All right. Thank you, everyone. So we have another half hour of networking, beer, pizza, and then we close at 9, and we close at 9 sharp. Please um, be good partners to, uh, to our friends at Yelp. Thank you, and see you next month.